folks, welcome to Source Fed Nerd. I'm Matt Lieberman. And I'm DJ Wolders. And there's a whole bunch of great superhero television that's on your TVs right now. We had a couple of new shows premiere, and uh, DJ and I wanted to talk about the four that are currently on the broadcast networks. We have uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. going in its second season. We have Arrow going on its third. We have the pilot of Gotham. Which is big news, and the pilot of The Flash. Yes, and not just the pilot of, of Gotham, the first three episodes. Yes. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's talk about Gotham. The biggest drama series coming to broadcast television this fall, the story about Jim Gordon in the years before Batman and how Gotham City became the Gotham it was when Batman, you know, needed to save it. And also, whether you like it or not, the story of young Bruce Wayne, even younger before he's Batman. Even though maybe it doesn't fit in really well with uh, what is essentially a cop drama in a crazy, loopy is town. Is it, though? Like, I feel like... We've watched the first three episodes, We've right? watched the first three episodes. Uh, I feel like it should decide... Like, if it were a com competent cop drama, mm -hmm. that would be fine, but it's not, like, anything. It yeah. just exists. It's, it's just, just a thing kind that of exists. Like, right now, so I, I had really high hopes about this show. Um, Bruno Heller, who ran Rome, which is which an amazing is, show, yeah. uh, is running this sh running this series. He also ran The Mentalist, which I never saw, but a lot of people like. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was very, very excited about it. But you're right. I feel like it's a series that doesn't quite know what it wants to be. Yeah. And right now, it just feels like a collection of tropes. Yeah, it feels like, it, it reeks of like, hey, you know what makes us a lot of money? A Batman show. But we can't do Batman, so we'll do it before. And so everybody just sat down and like, what do you think of when you think of Batman? Penguin. And Ju like, just throw it in there. Uh, yeah. The 66 series. Throw stuff in there. Like, yeah. just, it's just Poison a bunch of Ivy stuff. is a little girl. Yeah, it's just thrown in there. And it just doesn't, It's no. there's no cohesion. Right. I, I feel like what, uh, what Agents of Ste S.H.I.E.L.D. is starting to do very well, and what I think Arrow and The Flash do really well, is that they include their extended comic book universe, but they pick and choose, mm -hmm. uh, and they try to integrate it elegantly. Mm -hmm. Whereas this show, I feel like they threw everything in front of the camera all at once, and they're just trying to make it like, like, see, this is still cool. Batman's not here, but this is still cool. I feel like Gotham struggles from a similar problem that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has been struggling with and is getting better with, mm -hmm. because it's both, it's a comic book series without its headliner. Yeah. Hey, you guys wanna watch a Batman series without Batman? Yeah. You guys want to watch an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. series without Nick Fury? Well, yeah. which you can do. There's nothing because... But at one, least uh, at least Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has Nick Fury, like, every once in a while. Every once in a while, and it has Phil Coulson, yeah. which he should have just been a robot, but it has Phil Coulson. Uh, but uh, um, with Gotham, like, there's, there, it could be good, but the problem is you need to be smart enough to make the other characters as interesting as... Batman, which right. has been done. There was well, the Gotham Central comic, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of characters from that comic in the show, but they're all kind of boring. But they're like the worst versions of themselves. <laughs> uh, let's talk about what we liked about the okay. about these episodes, what we didn't like. That's a good um, I love the look of the show. I think mm -hmm. that uh, Gotham City is very well realized on mm -hmm. camera. Um, I think that Oswald Cobblepot, who will eventually become the Penguin, is probably the most compelling character on the show. Yeah. But after the first episode, where he had a lot of stuff to do and was intriguing, yeah. they've kind of... I don't know what, what to expect from him. He's gonna have an interesting plot line, yeah. but as a character, he's becoming more and more one note. Like, he kills people, that's his yeah. note. His note is, I'm psychotic, I want power, I want respect, I kill everybody. Yeah. yeah. Um, which but, is fine. But he's being well performed, and, and, and I think the, the thing these shows bank on mm -hmm. probably too much, but at least with Penguin you have, it's cool to see somebody playing Penguin again. Yeah. It's cool to have Penguin on my TV. Yeah, because uh, the last live action Penguin was Danny DeVito back in 1992. Long time ago, and not exactly the most faithful depiction of Penguin. Nope. Although iconic. Uh, mm -hmm. But another thing I really like, I don't know about you, I really like uh, Jada Pinkett Smith. As I think she's Fish great Mooney. as Fish Mooney. A lot she's of people not don't like it. To do, but yeah. it, it reminds me a lot of Eartha Kitt from the old '66 show. Yeah, but that's the thing is like Gotham is so mythic and it's so loud. Like its mm -hmm. its characters are big. The Rogues Gallery. The reason it's the reason why it's the best Rogues Gallery ever is because they're all like big, loud characters. They should be able to chew the scenery, and yeah. she does just that. Yeah. And I feel like she's swinging for the fences with this like big character and some people find it uncomfortable because everybody else is playing it straight yeah but it's the people who are playing it straight who are boring like ben yeah. mckenzie as jim gordon isn't giving us much to work with because he's just sort of like i'm an honest cop yeah and i'm gonna make i'm gonna clean up this city yeah. but i have to do it from the inside 
but I'm an honest cop. Well, and the truth is, like, uh, he was in Southland and stuff like that. If, if, you were gonna, if you were gonna cast a young Jim Gordon, like, this be the guy, mm -hmm. just the, sh he's, the, the cast of the show is really solid. Mm -hmm. Like, Donald Logue, uh, I we've both seen Terriers. If Love you haven't, I don't Donald know where Logue. you're gonna find it, but find it and watch it, it's it amazing. It used to be on Netflix. It, it was no it? Longer? Yeah, it was. It was on Netflix. That's I where I watched see, it. Okay, good. I need to double check. It's one of the best, like, brilliant but canceled shows of all time. Yeah, and Donald Logue is great in it, mm -hmm. and he could be great as Harvey Bullock. But he's not. That, that's the thing. There are so many characters, and there's so many future villains that we're trying to serve, and so much arc building that we're trying to serve right here at the top that. We have yet to have anything to hold on to that makes us care about any of our characters. Yeah. And that's that's the big issue. What I think um, The Flash is doing really well right off the top is making the characters really relatable. Yep. Um, I think that's what Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is doing really well in its second season. Yep. Uh, from everything that I've heard about the first two seasons of Arrow, I haven't really watched Arrow myself. That's okay, I've watched um, it. Yeah, but <laughs> like great. everything that I've seen it's a show that loves its characters. And I feel like if Gotham is ever going to take off the way that it needs to, it really has to slow its role and give us a reason to care about anybody. Yeah. Because why do we care about all these dirty cops? Yeah, especially since uh, the Gotham Police Department is simultaneously the most corrupt and inept institution I think I've ever seen on TV. Yeah. Like I don't, I think that's a problem I have is I have no idea how the city functions as a city. Mm -hmm. Like how does it exist? Like how does it have an economy? Like I mean, well, it's like it it's like 1900 New York City where everyone was on the tape. Yeah, well, but it's one of those like it's it's. It's comical in a lot of ways, but then it wants to be grittier than it is. Mm. And it's just a weird, I think we're both in agreement that the scene that had the most personality of any of the episodes, mm -hmm. uh, or any of the scenes so far, is when Balloon Man, which was a fucking dumb concept, but uh, when one of his victims drops from the sky onto a woman walking her dog. And yeah. it's so darkly comic that it's like, oh, this is, this show's promise. It's actually right. like, as personality, it's distinguishable. It wants to do something different from any other show on TV, but there's just, it, there's not enough of it yet. And I'm willing to give the show a little leeway, but I, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to watch it regularly yeah, without signs episodes. of improvement. Yeah. Um, Speaking of signs of improvement, yeah. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which premiered last year, and a lot of people didn't like it. A lot of people were very disappointed. Uh, I'm in the camp that it improved about halfway through the season and got progressively better every week. I would say it improved later than halfway. Literally, like, Captain America Winter Soldier came out right, in the show. Right, in that show. last six it, episodes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it got a lot better really quickly. Exactly. Uh, but then there were people who still didn't even like those. But the first three episodes of this season mm -hmm. have shown such a confidence yes. in its storytelling. I feel like they've really hit on a formula that works well for them. They've given every single character either a needed reboot mm -hmm. to make them less annoying or more effective. Like mm -hmm. Sky especially was the worst character in season one. And now she is a badass field agent. Yeah, she yeah, what, yeah. She's what she needs to be, but she still has a weak spot yeah. for Ward, who is doing like this kind of weird Hannibal Lecter like thing, thing yeah. which is Mr. much nice cooler yeah. than just being handsome, ba had handsome badass, yeah, yeah, yeah. which he didn't really play very well. Giving these characters something interesting to do and something that, that is at odds with who they want to be is making them more watchable and giving them a defined enemy in Hydra and Which something is what to it work needed against. In season one, the first half of season one, I was sitting there going, "Where's Hydra? Where? Where? I mean, they need or aim or any one of the other organizations kind of, of the comics. That, enemy, like, yeah, because you don't want to watch a bunch of people in a jumbo jet." just fight everybody on the planet because they can't and it's not effective, you're not working towards something, versus having a defined enemy means we have an obstacle to overcome. Yeah. We are working against people who are better staffed, have more money, have more equipment, and there's just a few of us in what looks almost like a basement. Yeah. How are we ever going to survive? Yeah, they're and underdogs now, stakes. which adds, because before they were the top dog on the totem pole, so there's really like, you, you really got the impression that Coulson's team was like, oh, we're the fun jaunty team of S.H.I.E.L.D. that just right. goes out and does, you know, has fun, you know what I mean? And it's like, well. There isn't a ton of room for 22 episodes of jaunt a yeah. season, okay? You can get like four or five but you have to earn them by grounding the show in realistic stakes and giving us characters that we care about so that when we get a fun episode or a light episode, it's a relief. Yeah. It's like, oh great, we can just have fun with these people that we like before we watch them be in actual Jeopardy again. Mm -hmm. What I loved about the season opener is they 
immediately killed, they killed off a big guest star. I won't say who, just in case you intend to watch it and you aren't yeah. sure. But they killed off someone that it appeared was going to be sticking around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And first of all, it was a big surprise. And second, it sent a clear message. No one is safe. Mm -hmm. People will die this season. This is not this is not your mom and dad's agents to shield. Yeah, I think as a, as a reader of the comic books, I think one thing because uh, I'd been a little spoiled with Arrow because I don't know what DC's bigger plan with all this stuff is whether it's supposed to be all interconnected or not. Mm -hmm. But they were very liberal with using characters from the comic books. Yeah, and uh, Agents of Shield at the start was very very uh, nervous uh, frugal yeah. about that. And right at the top we had um, Crusher Creel, we had an Absorbing Man mm -hmm. who was a good foil. Yeah, like he 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 benefited um, the same way Winter Soldier benefited Captain America. You knew when he showed up, shit was gonna get real. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it was cool. And the way they for the budget the show had, the way they displayed his powers was solid. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bobby Morris, Mockingbird's gonna show up later. Um, they had Blizzard show up for yeah. the second time, and they didn't waste his appearance. They immediately they found ways to make the character darker and mm -hmm. have more more of an axe to grind. And then not killing him off at the end of the episode. Well, I, well, arguable, but I'm pretty sure not. he's coming back. Yeah, probably. Pretty not. sure he's coming back, and he's going to be doing something even more interesting. I love that we have one of the characters now as a spy inside Hydra, and it's the last person you'd expect. It's the last one you would expect, but to like almost do you. Buy that she'd be the one that they. I think that they're out of options. Yeah. I think that they're out of options, and she's also the only non-field agent yeah. that they have. I feel like if it was somebody who had been out in the field, there's a much better chance that Hydra members would know who they were. Yeah, I think the secret weapon of the show has been Fitz, because mm -hmm. the way um, his actor portrayed, he's dealing with Ward's betrayal. Yeah, and uh, he's the uh, fact that he would never let it go. And he's right got until, brain damage. Yeah, and now he's got and now he's got brain damage. The the third episode when he finally confronts Ward in the basement, I thought was some of the best acting I've ever seen on that show. Yeah, it was it was excellent, yeah. and it's only the third episode of the season. Yeah. And to me, it feels like it, also one of the best things about it. There are no new Marvel movies coming out during this season, yeah. which means that they don't have any corporate bullshit that yeah. they have to deal with. They don't have to do weird tie-in episodes that feel strange and are never satisfying because they don't have the budget yeah. to make it feel like the movies, but you have something from... Stop it. Yeah. Make your own show, which is what they're doing, yeah. and they have a really cool idea in terms of how to do a release this year where they're doing 10 episodes or 11 episodes of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah. Go, uh, without any breaks, going right into Agent Carter. Which I'm very excited about. Very excited about, and then coming right back into Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. for the rest of the season. And what I think they're going to do, and uh, so they opened the season two opener with a part of Agent Carter, with, mm -hmm. and yeah, connecting yeah, yeah. it to the present storyline. The whole first season of Agent Carter is going to inform the second half of the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. season. It, the, I think it's going to involve an overlying plot, the same villain mm -hmm. running throughout. And what we just watched was the season premiere of Arrow, which I know you haven't watched before. But you I really the, enjoyed this season the, premiere. You saw the pilot and saw the season premiere. Mm -hmm. um, I, Arrow is one of those shows that really surprised me when it came out because the pilot was like a lot of pilots where it's, it's okay. It's fine. Yeah. It didn't grab me. That's why I didn't start watching. And then the show really did a good job of escalating itself to the, where at the end of season one, you're like, I can't believe this is happening. Mm -hmm. And then season two fed right off of that and kept even more escalating. And then they introduced The Flash, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Yeah. And there's really... It's a CW show. Mm -hmm. And my, what that means to my brain is that it shouldn't be good. And uh, they do a really good job. I feel like the action choreography in the show is some of the best on TV. Yep. Um, it's some of the most daring plot lines that you'll see outside of cable. Yeah. That uh, that Arrow versus Arrow fight. In um, the season three premiere. In yeah, the season yeah, yeah. Pre three premiere was appropriately brutal. Yeah. I really appreciated the acrobatics. Oh, my gosh. And you didn't get to see uh, uh, old Count Vertigo, mm -hmm. but new Count Vertigo. Peter Stormare. Peter Stormare. Huge improvement. Really yeah. great, which is good for... Again, the comic book fan in me because Count Vertigo is one of the few like straight up Green Arrow villains Green Arrow has. Yeah. Uh, so it's good to see him done. 
uh, well. We're comic book guys, but I appreciate a good romance, and I know that it's like it's a CW show, so yeah. it's going to be a little bit soapier. Yeah. But I didn't really, I didn't mind the relationship subplot in the in the season opener. And frankly, I like it when characters get together because then it gets messy, and that gives mm -hmm. you just more stuff to work with. Because yeah. then, no matter what threats are out there, we've got a, an internal threat, which is that we're not working together properly. We got too much personal shit going exactly. on. I love that. I will say I, I like this premiere. I think season two's premiere was better. It was okay. a better premiere for the show. But I am very interested to see. We saw Ray Palmer mm -hmm. this episode. A lot of fun. Brandon um, Ralph. I think I th it's pretty clear that they're building up a TV Justice League mm -hmm. while they're building up the movie Justice League uh, with all the characters that are premiering between this and The Flash. And I'm really excited to see maybe a big crossover finale either this year or next year with Flash and Arrow, depending on how You know what? Like this, this premiere, like it made me feel... It made me kind of feel like Chuck. Like it wasn't as funny as Chuck mm -hmm. necessarily, but like that era of show where you had Chuck and Fringe, which were these like great genre sci-fi-ish kind of shows uh, that were fun, but also actiony mm -hmm. um, and knew not to take anything too seriously. Yeah but took things just seriously enough. And maybe it's that Brandon Routh connection. I'm just going yeah, back yeah, to like yeah. season three of Chuck. But I really, really enjoyed what I saw. And now, I mean, I never have any time, but I'm gonna try to go back and watch all of Arrow. Yeah. Um, as so many people on Twitter told me I had to do, there was no way that I could catch up. <laughs> I'm telling you, there you were no key you episodes. You just really need to catch up, but I mean, like, if you do, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Yeah. One thing I like about what um, uh, that team, the team that's creating Arrow and now is creating The Flash and mm -hmm. in the future might be creating Supergirl, is um, they're not afraid to pull inspiration from Marvel stuff. Ray Palmer very much felt like a smarmy Mr. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And Barry Allen has a very, in the, especially in kind the past, a, a very Parker Peter, Peter Parker vibe. And I think it benefits because a lot of those Silver Age characters um, from DC just had that square-jawed hero thing going on. It's good to mix it up. And, and uh, in the comics, Barry Allen in, started out as a fanboy. Yeah. And so now we're just using that to inform the rest of his character. Right. He's like a sweet guy. Let's talk about The Flash, which honestly... Mm -hmm is my favorite broadcast pilot in a long time. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. The effects work really well. I like all the actors. Jesse L. Martin mm -hmm. is great. Like, and Br like, I think, honestly, one of the huge strengths in the show right out of the gate is its casting, mm -hmm. um, because there's no one I hate. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. no one I hate, and Jesse L. Martin brings that, like, grounded, realistic acting yeah. gravitas. I thought it was a great choice to have him know that Barry was the Flash right out of the yeah. gate and not have it be a mystery that he finds out in eight episodes yeah. because you need him to depend on people. And having Tom Cavanaugh as yep. uh, the head of Star Labs. Yep, in a very intriguing role. A very intriguing role, and he's doing something really cool with it. He's very, very compelling, and he's not giving a lot away. Yeah. Um, and having those two kind of counterpoles makes Grant Gustin even less offensive <laughs> as Barry. Like, that's the thing, it's like, he's somebody who, he doesn't, he still doesn't quite strike me as a great actor, mm -hmm. but he's, a very likable actor, yeah, and uh, he embodies the character very, very well, this yeah. version of the character. And I'm hoping, Stephen Amell was very unoffensive at the beginning of Arrow, and he's kind of grown into the role that mm -hmm. where he really excels at it. I'm kind of hoping for a similar thing with Grant Gustin, the more time we give him to embody the role that'll grow into it and really make us by him as the character. Yeah, I also think that they're, the more time they spend writing the show, the more they will learn how to write for Grant, and I mm -hmm. think they had a great advantage in having the that two-parter with him last mm -hmm. season on mm -hmm. Arrow, Arrow yep. so they already know how he handles their dialogue, so they already have a bit of a jump start yeah. in how to write this version of Barry. Well, and really, I think because this team worked on Arrow, they kind of had a jump start on the whole Flash dynamic. Like, mm -hmm. it took it took uh, Arrow a while for it to develop its family, and those showrunners realized that worked for them, having a family of characters all around their central hero. Yeah. And so we've kind of, like, right off the bat, we have Tam, uh, Tom Cavanaugh's character. Mm -hmm. um, we have Daniel Parker, Panabaker. Daniel Panabaker um, uh, as Killer Frost. I don't know her civilian name. Um, and and uh, uh, Paco Ramon, who mm -hmm. becomes Vibe in the comics and probably will here as well. Um, and they all serve a function around Barry. Um, and Jesse L. Martin's character, yes. uh, you know, as who will be his tie to the police force, yeah, his yeah, stepdad. Yeah. Um, or 
whatever. Whatever. Yeah, caretaker. Foster, Foster took parent, care whatever. of. Yeah. He's nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's nice to him. He was in Rent. And then uh, uh, we got to mention uh, uh, John Wesley Ship, who was the classic '90s Flash mm-hmm. as it's Barry's father. I thought that's father. a great bit of yeah, casting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love what you're saying about building a family around your main character and having a team. It's very Angel, mm-hmm. um, which is a yep. show that I think worked really well because of I the agree. family. And I think it's one of the key reasons why Gotham doesn't work is because yeah. there is no team. He is a lone crusader, Jim Gordon is a lone yeah. crusader against a whole group of people that are criminals or they're cops who are criminals. Yeah. There's no one for him to really express himself to except for his girlfriend um, who isn't gonna be able to help him that much as the character's been painted. Yeah. He needs people who are on his side because he's not the most interesting person. Yeah. Like that's the thing, is when you have somebody who's uh, just, their only character attribute is that they point true north, yeah. that they are a good person, you need interesting people around them for them bounce to bounce off, off of. of. Yeah. Yeah. And to help define their rough edges. And until they give that to Jim Gordon, he's never going to be a great TV protagonist. I agree. I agree completely. The one thing I want to tell you spoilers right now, some of the things I'm most excited about in the Flash premiere are spoilery things. So if Spoiler you alert! If you haven't seen the Flash premiere, go see it. I'm probably there's probably gonna be an, an, an annotation there that you can click ahead and avoid all this stuff. Spoiler alert, spoiler <laughs> alert, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. But um uh, I think it's really great. Uh, they, I think the other thing that we get because these guys have been working on it is a fearlessness with the mythology. Mm-hmm. We have a reference to Gorilla Grodd <gasps> right off the bat, which you better deliver. Fucking you deliver. You better, that better not be the only reference If that is a red herring cage and you just, he never comes back, shame on you, Mark Guggenheim. Uh, Cause uh, I don't I'm know how they're gonna- I'm not that mad. I, I don't know how they're gonna do it though. I don't know how you're gonna do Gorilla Grodd believably on a CW budget, but also, uh, do a ends, bunch of cheapo episodes. Yeah, the the end, which is which I imagine they'd have to because this pilot, watching this premiere, I felt like I was watching a superhero movie. Yeah, like the, a lot of the effects were they were TV effects, but they were executed well. I thought the tornado was surprisingly well. Mm-hmm. Like these, rendered. these are the effects that, like, if this movie, was, if this TV show was made in the '90s as a movie, yeah. these would be the quality of effects that we would have gotten. But I don't think I've ever watched a TV show and felt more like. Oh, this is a live action superhero show. Great. I know that there was a Flash show in the 90s. Like, I watched episodes of it. I don't remember that well, but I watched it when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. But this is the first time, like, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't really have superheroes in it. Has gifted. Uh, uh, Arrow is a, is a vigilante. It's more of a Batman vibe. Most, I can't think. I mean, I know Smallville had Clark when he was younger, but they were really sparse with the powers because it cost money. Like, I felt like I was watching a legitimate, honest to goodness superhero show yeah. for the first time. And it, it was impressive to me. And I think one thing that, uh, again, going back to the spoilers, the bit with Tom Cavanaugh at the end, when he's looking at a paper from the future, mm-hmm. that means the comic book, the fanboy in my, just the brain, my brain melted. Because that means somewhere in this timeline, we probably won't ever see it, the crisis of infinite earths happens. Yeah! And Barry Allen dies. And I think, and I was reading a thing on the paper, there's something about Queen and Wayne Industries merging. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was just one of those like, they just reference Crisis of Infinite Earths. I just watched yeah. an episode of TV that just referenced Reference Crisis, Crisis of Infinite, Infinite, Infinite Earths. And like, if it's not a red herring, and if it's not something that's ultimately gonna be retconned, and it's pointing towards a unified DC TV universe, we live in exciting times. We do. I, I'm still on the fence of whether I feel like, whether I want Arrow and Flash to be connected to the movies or not. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't. Because I don't quite want to. Because then, when they come back yeah. from the movies, if they get first of all, there's going to be a movie Flash. Grant Gustin is not going to be the Flash in the Justice League. Oh, you don't think even if it's all connected? I I, I think the reason we haven't heard a definitive yes or no is because they're waiting to see how Flash does hmm. and how it's received. And if it does great, Grant Gustin will be the one we see in the movie. Really? And then we'll be like, guess what, Marvel? <laughs> We're way ahead of you, at least on the TV game. Because on the TV game, they're on top. Warner Brothers pulling all the stops. I. I, I, part of me would like it because, part of, for the same reason, I feel like Arrow and Flash are so much better than Man of Steel was. Mm-hmm. That like I kind of want them to be connected to kind of elevate that, but then I also don't want this stinking up my Arrow. And my Flash. I just, I just think when you've got big corporate synergy, yeah, 
it's only gonna lead to trouble. Like the, the great thing that the Marvel Cinematic Universe has is that it has Kevin Feige, it has that one unifying yeah. person all making Marvel all movies. the creative decisions. Yeah, those movies are his movies. They're, They're his not, movies. No. He hires directors to make movies for him. He lays out, this is the movie that I want. It's why it's why Edgar Wright left, and Edgar mm -hmm. Wright's Ant-Man would have been really, really cool, yeah. but it would not have been an, a Marvel movie, and that's why he didn't want to do it. That's yeah. why he ultimately changed his mind. Yeah. Um, and so, I don't think that Warner Brothers has that person yet, yeah. and combining that with TV, which is already on a tight schedule and doesn't have time for endless development meetings yeah. about a connection, just leave it alone. Let yeah. us let us have our cool thing. You finally are giving us a cool thing. Yeah. Don't mess with the cool thing. Yeah. Let us have it. And I, and I like the freedom. I get the feeling when I watch Arrow and Flash that they're just allowed to do what they want. I'm like, oh, no, 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 there's none of this. Oh, you can't reference that, which used to be, I remember it was a big thing back in the time Small was on. He, they couldn't have any references to Batman or Wonder Woman because they were developing movies, so we couldn't have that. Mm -hmm. You don't get that impression with, with Arrow and, and Flash. The great thing about this like comic book arms race is that it's gotten people to be less and less precious mm -hmm. about referencing other properties mm -hmm. because Marvel got away with it and it's working. So now everybody yeah. else is learning their lesson and is starting to loosen up all of these restrictions. Yeah. Again, exciting times. The one thing, the other thing I want to want to mention about Flash is there's uh, it's an awkward scene where Barry meets Arrow, mm -hmm. and I think it, oh, it's yeah. a scene that kind of, but it, it describes uh, what uh, I recently just shot an interview Trisha did with a real life a real life superhero a guy named Danger Man who dresses up like a superhero, and his big thing is he goes and he visits kids, and it's that reminder that like these guys in these colorful costumes are meant for. Kids. Not just kids, but like the that that the, that youthfulness in us, in that, all of yeah, us, yeah, yeah, the yeah. hopefulness. Exactly, yeah. and so that's something that Arrow really banks. It, it's fun, but it banks a lot on the darker. It's, it's definitely spawned from the Dark Knight movies, mm -hmm. and the Flash is allowed as as uh, Ollie says to Barry and the thing to inspire people in a way that he couldn't, and it's allowed to be fun and light and it's and the full same of way. It's the same way that the Batman animated series and the Superman animated series in the 90s were so diametrically opposite in their approach to their characters yep. and in their sense of humor. The Batman animated series didn't really have much of one. Mm -hmm. The Superman animated series had a great sense of humor. It was light, it was art deco, it was poppy. Yep. And I like both of them, but ultimately I have more fun watching the Superman show because yeah. it's meant to be fun and that's why I like Flash so much. I mean, I'm excited to see how they cross over. I know there's a two-parter crossover episode coming in uh, a couple months. Um, I think it's supposed See. to be like the eighth or ninth episode of the season for both shows. It's gonna start on Flash and then finish on Arrow the next night, uh, which is like old school exciting. Buffy Angel yep. kind of stuff. That gets me, I can't tell you how excited that gets me. Yeah. Um, so, folks, thank you so much for checking out with us all these great shows. Uh, let us know your feelings on those shows down in the comments below. Are you looking forward to Constantine, which is coming out soon in yep, a couple, couple weeks? weeks yeah. Uh, Just and Halloween. yeah, and all the uh, new Netflix shows. You know, is there something else in the superhero world that's on TV that you want us to talk about? I know there are lots of great animated series. Yep, yep. Um, you know, so uh, let us know. Thank you guys so much for joining and us. And please let us know if this is something you want us to keep doing. If this yeah. is like how you want us to keep updating with these shows. Or Whatever. If you want us to keep doing it, maybe uh, tell your friends to watch it. Yeah, Share the video. For those who care, by the way, comic books uh, this week, uh, you should have picked up Witches, number one. If you haven't picked it up, you should. It's a horror comic. It's really great. And uh, next week is the last issue of The Death of Wolverine. Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, I'm sure that's going to last a long time. Thanks, guys, for watching. I'm Matt Lieberman. I'm DJ Woldridge. Also, Deadly Class, number eight. It's another indie book you should buy. Okay, I get it. You like comic books. And Justice League, number 35. He knows, he knows his Lex, books. Lex Luthor's in it. He's part of the Justice League now. It's really interesting. Lex Luthor's part of the Justice League It's now? real interesting. Come on, guys. <laughs>